President Donald Trump have expressed their desire to meet again and hold another summit. But can the two sides narrow their differences enough to make it happen? We'll discuss that further in today's broadcast. But first, we start by heading over to our news centre, where Devin Whiting brings us the latest headlines. Devin. Hi, jang -ho. First to the dispute over Japan's claims that a South Korean warship used its targeting radar to lock onto a Japanese patrol plane. The South Korean Defense Ministry has released a video taking on the claims point by point and making the case that the Japanese plane's low-altitude flight over the ship was dangerous and threatening to the Korean ship. For the latest, we connect to our Defense Ministry correspondent, Park Ji-won. Ji-won? Devin, South Korea's Ministry of National Defense released a video on its official YouTube account at 2 o'clock this afternoon. In the four-minute video, the Republic of Korean Navy asked Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Forces why in international waters where another country's warship is engaged in the humanitarian rescue of a ship in distress, that Japan would send a patrol aircraft on threatening low-altitude flight in the first place. The video says the Japanese plane approached the South Korean destroyer from a distance of just 500 meters and an altitude of just 150 meters. The ship's crew said they heard loud noise and felt strong vibrations due to the flight, which they said was menacing and threatening. The video released by Japan last week showed the Japanese plane recognized that the South Korean ship was on a rescue mission, but the South Korean video said the plane nonetheless continued its unprofessional, aggressive flight at a very close distance. A military aircraft, is said, should not conduct such a low-altitude flight near a foreign warship because it could cause accidental clashes. Also, Japan had claimed the plane followed international grid rules when it came to the flight's altitude. For that claim, Japan quoted annexed regulations of the Convention on International Civil Aviation. However, the South Korean Defense Ministry pointed out that Article 3 of the convention clearly states that the agreement applies only to civil aircraft and not to military, customs and police services. So the video points out that Japan is interpreting an international agreement in an arbitrary way to justify its false claim. So the video, um, and also South Korea once again stressed that its warship did not log on the plane using its fire control radar. Rather, it used only search radars for humanitarian purposes. The defense ministry's video pointed out, based on Japan's own video, the Japanese pilots knew the ship's guns were not pointed at them and knew the South Korean ship had no intention of attacking. Lastly, the video says communications from the Japanese plane were extremely unclear because of loud noises. The video includes actual sound recordings from the ship showing the messages were almost impossible to understand. The Defense Ministry stressed once again that the South Korean Navy had no intention of threatening the Japanese plane, saying that if Japan has any evidence of radar frequency, then it should provide it at working-level meetings. South Korean Ministry also urged Japan to apologize for its aggressive low-altitude flight and urged Japan not to use the incident for political reasons. Well, that's all I have for now. Back to you, Devin. All right, and that video is online as of this afternoon. Thanks for that, G1. In other news, South Korea's new finance minister says the government will front load more than 60 percent of its spending in the first half of the year. Speaking on Friday at a meeting of economy-related ministers, Hong Nam-gi said the government will spend 157 billion U.S. dollars in the first half to improve people's livelihoods, create new jobs, and boost social infrastructure. He added the government will announce its draft plan to overhaul the way the minimum wage is decided by next week. That's so it can be in place before the rate is set for next year. The minister vowed last month to moderate the pace of wage increases in the face of a growing backlash over the double-digit hikes in 2018 and 2019. South Korean stocks recovered today on news that the U.S. and China will hold trade talks next week. The benchmark KOSPI, after its lowest close in two years on Thursday, rose above the psychologically important 2000 level on Friday to close at 2010, a gain of eight-tenths of a percent. Institutions bought shares worth more than $198 million. The tech-heavy KOSDAQ also rose by more than one percent to close at 664. 
There were concerns that Korean stocks might take their cue from Wall Street and other markets and close today in the red. Another twist in the case of the North Korean diplomat who is apparently in hiding. It's still not clear what he's trying to do. The diplomat, Cho sung gil had been in charge of the North's embassy in Italy, and reports said he was seeking asylum. But Italy says he is not currently under its protection, and officials here in Seoul said he hasn't tried to contact the South Korean government. EG1 has the latest. The Italian government has confirmed that the missing North Korean diplomat has not requested asylum as of now. An official in Italy's Foreign Affairs Ministry said this to the Associated Press on Thursday, adding that Cho Sung-gil, the charge d'affaires of the North Embassy in Rome, no longer held diplomatic status in Italy, presumably since his assignment had ended in late November. This comes after South Korean newspaper Chungang Ilbo reported Thursday, citing diplomatic sources, that Cho had applied for personal security protection from the Italian government in early December and that he and his family are currently under the protection of Italian authorities. Personal security protection is a diplomatic procedure aimed to prevent people from being repatriated while seeking asylum. According to the paper, Cho went into hiding with his wife in early November in an attempt to seek asylum to a third country. His current whereabouts is still unknown. Though the Italian official said its foreign ministry hadn't received any request for asylum, Italian daily La Repubblica said that it's possible that the North Korean might have turned to other offices, such as Italian intelligence agencies, for assistance. The South Korean government on Thursday said they have no information regarding the report. But according to lawmakers who were briefed by Seoul's intelligence agency, it is not yet clear whether Cho is hoping to defect to South Korea, and there has been no attempt by Cho to contact the government. Cho was dispatched to Italy in May 2015 and started to run the North Korean mission there in October 2017 as the Italian government expelled the North's ambassador Moon Jong-nam after Pyongyang's sixth nuclear test. It's believed that Cho decided to seek asylum after he was ordered to return home. A major reason is deemed to be the education of his children. This is believed to be the third case where a senior North Korean diplomat initially requested asylum to a country other than South Korea, the last one being Taeyong Ho, a former minister at the North Embassy in London, who defected to the South in 2016. Lee ji -won, Arirang News. In the United States, the Democrats now have control over the House of Representatives. Lawmakers were sworn in on Thursday, and they make up what's being called the most diverse Congress America's ever had. The Democrats are saying they're going to end the government shutdown that started over President Trump's demand that they fund a wall on the border with Mexico. But Trump and the Republicans are holding firm. Noah Am reports. The Democrats have gotten straight to business, preparing to pass legislation that would end the shutdown without giving President Trump funding for his border wall. The 116th Congress convened Thursday with roughly a quarter of the federal government closed, which has affected 800,000 employees. Democratic lawmaker Nancy Pelosi has reclaimed the Speaker's gavel. She called the House to order and said legislation would be proposed that aims to break the impasse. I'm particularly proud to be the woman Speaker of the House of this Congress, which marks the 100th year of women having the right to vote. We will debate and advance good ideas no matter where they come from. And in that spirit, Democrats will be offering the Senate Republican appropriations legislation to reopen government later today. One of the proposed bills does include funding for border security, but the amount is nowhere near the $5 billion demanded by President Trump. Republican senators have dismissed the proposed bills, accusing the Democrats of playing politics. Trump congratulated Pelosi on becoming House Speaker again, but he reiterated his position on border security. Without a wall, you cannot have border security. Without a very for strong form of barrier, call it what you will, but without a wall, you cannot have border security. It won't work. No Adam, Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting, and those are your news headlines.
With Kim Jong-un's New Year's address and his letter to President Trump, a second summit between the leaders of North Korea and the United States appears to be on the horizon. It's a positive sign after months of stalled nuclear negotiations between the two sides. But will it actually take place? We'll discuss that with our guest further. But first, our Park Jun has this report. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump both say they are ready for a second summit. We had our meeting six months ago in Singapore. Uh, we'll probably now have another meeting. He'd like to meet. I'd like to meet. The U.S. has been hoping to hold the second Kim Jong meeting early this year. And with the two leaders having set the stage for a second summit, there is a higher possibility of it actually happening. But it depends largely on how flexible Washington is willing to be over its past demands. Because in Kim's New Year's speech, he made it clear that he wants the nuclear negotiations to center on limiting North Korea's future nuclear capabilities, not its existing nuclear weapons. Then North Korea is not interested in talking about its nuclear weapons. One bright side of the New Year's address is that it might be easier for them to uh, start the negotiation focusing more on the future capabilities, such as uh, freezing the capabilities and facilities of, New of North Korea. So maybe uh, President Trump and the Kim Chairman Kim uh, might be able to reach an like, interim agreement before FFBD, uh, which is about freezing and uh, limiting the current capability of North Korea's nuclear weapons. That will determine whether or not there will be high-level or working-level talks between the two sides that could lead to a second summit. And even when that's settled, there's still the question of lifting sanctions on the North. It's a long road ahead before the two leaders actually meet face-to-face, -face, but experts say it's a positive turn that could lead to progress in these stalled negotiations. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News. For more, joining us now, we have with us Dr. Ko myung Hyun, a research fellow from the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Welcome back to the show. Pleasure to be here. So, do you agree that with the end of that mm. report that says, despite what both uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un have said, a second summit between the two leaders is still a long way off? Well, probably that's the case because even the, 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 the remark by President Trump that President Trump and Kim Jong-un will meet soon has been made several times already. I mean, at least we have heard this probably like five times. And they started like a, some, some, something like October last year. So every time President Trump says we want to meet soon, uh, that didn't really happen. So it's always about it take place tomorrow and tomorrow will never come. So chances that uh, the two sides are probably long way off from meeting because the North Korea and the United States are still far apart when it comes to defining even the basic conceptualization of denuclearization. So without that agreement, I mean, it will be difficult for the two sides to meet. And even if the two sides actually do meet, uh, the whatever, I mean, there will be no agreement coming out of the summit. And that means that the current impasse of the, uh, the negotiations between the two sides will continue, even if there's another uh, summit. So what do you think needs to happen for these two sides to break the current deadlock? What do the two sides need to offer at this point? Well, so at least one side will have to uh, make a compromise about their, their current position. Either North Korea takes a very strong and significant measures towards denuclearization, going beyond, the, I mean, at least going uh, to shut down the Dongchangri and the Punggye test sites. Or the United States essentially takes a step back and saying we relent the pressure on North Korea and then and also like I said, relax some of the sanctions measures as North Korea has requested, and then that might actually allow the two sides to meet finally. Mm. Perhaps though, uh, uh, Kim Jong Un has already given a hint to the kind mm. of things mm. he's looking for. He stated in his New Year's Day speech that he has intentions to resume the Kaesong Industrial Complex mm -hmm. and the Mount Kungangsan tour projects, adding that he's willing to do so without mm. uh, preconditions. I mean, before we go into what this means by preconditions, mm -hmm. what is the uh, Kungangsan project and what is the Kaesong Industrial Complex? And why is this important for Kim Jong-un? Well, this represents, uh, I mean, the very, two very important inter-Korean economic cooperation projects. Uh, the uh, Kaesong Industrial Complex essentially represents uh, the first uh, major foreign investment free trade area in North Korea uh, done entirely 
by the South Korean investments. Uh, it specializes in uh, production of light, light manufactured goods such as garments and um, small little electronic uh, items. And uh, Mount Kungang is a purely a tourism project. Uh, and then uh, North Korea, I mean, there was, uh, the project actually was live uh, with, um, in, the, in the 2000s. And then uh, South Korea subsidized uh, the South Korean tourists going to North Korea. So two, si uh, two projects jointly represented a very important source of foreign currency income for the North Korean regime. Uh, for instance, the Kaesong Industrial Complex uh, allowed the regime to earn up to $90 million in wages from South Korea. And the Mount Kungang pro uh, project, uh, probably hundreds of millions as well. Mm. He said in his speech, you know, he, w he intends to mm. reopen this, but without preconditions. What does this phrase mean, without preconditions? Well, he's referring to the payoffs. Uh, he could have asked uh, South Korea to uh, um, pay up uh, some sort of, uh, you know, initial fee for reopening the Kaesong Industrial Complex. Uh, same with the Mount Kungang pro, uh, Tourism Project. Uh, especially with the Mount Kungang Tourism Project, he could have asked South Korea to, uh, I mean, to pay a significant access fee to come to the, to the area. But he's basically implying that uh, he won't charge South Korean tourists from coming to, Ma uh, to go to Mount Kungang. So that really represents an uh, enticement on the part of North Korea, but, or North Korea, but also a way for North Korea to exploit the gray area of UN sanctions. The current UN sanctions measures don't target uh, the tourism per se, but they target the inflow of money that could result from tourism. So what Kim Jong-un is basically saying is that, look, we are not going to charge money for your tourists to come, but if you come, I mean, if you want to spend money once you're inside the country, that's really up to you, and then if that just represents a violation of sanctions, that's your problem, not ours. So that's probably what he means by without preconditions. Can he actually really do that, though? Can he, can he really restart the Kaesong Industrial Complex and the Mount Kungangshan uh, tour program, even when uh, international sanctions are still in place on uh, the regime? So with, uh, with the Kaesong Industrial Complex, it would be very difficult to start the complex by himself, by North Korea alone. Uh, first of all, in the from the companies that base their production there happen to be South Koreans. So it be, has to be allowed, allowed by the South Korean government to, for the South Korean companies to go back to North Korea and restart their uh, production facilities. So that's going to be a problem. But what's more important, much more actually a serious problem for North Korea is that uh, the workers who come to the Kaesong Industrial Complex to work will have to be paid. But there's no practical way for the South Korean companies or any other countries, uh, you know, investment or like a companies to pay the uh, to pay the North Korean uh, workers to potentially work there. So that's uh, one important problem. You know, another problem is that once you have a production there, uh, you cannot really get the products out of North Korea anymore because uh, the UN sanctions actually forbids uh, export of many important, uh, I mean, manufactured items coming out of North Korea now. So there's uh, for the products to be, I mean, it, first of all, it's difficult to pay the workers. Second is that there's no way for anybody to sell the products made in North Korea now. So that's the problem with the Kaesong Industrial Complex. We Mount Kungang obviously is the, the ban by the United Nations of uh, you know, transfer of money or bulk cash. Mm. So from what you're saying, there's a lot of uh, things that South Korea needs to be involved in here as well because a lot of these projects are to do with interaction with South Koreans. But then how risky is this for South Korea to go ahead with this, uh, with in these international sanctions uh, on the regime? Well, clearly there are sanctions currently in place against North Korea. So if South Korea uh, does... Uh, start investing in the Kaesong Industrial Complex or allow our own, uh, nationals of people to go to North Korea for tourism uh, will be potentially uh, in violation of sanctions. So although UN uh, sanctions don't have an enforcement mechanism, it's really up to the member states to enforce the measures. Uh, what's really uh, worrisome is the, pot uh, the prospect of a secondary boycott by the U.S. government. Mm. The U.S., for instance, have very strong export control measures against uh, uh, North Korea and also he actually uh, targets uh, companies that invest in North Korea or allows any kind of a transaction or like uh, activities that uh, benefits the North Korean regime. So uh, it's put, uh, if any South Korean company in makes investment or significant investment in North Korea, that company could be potentially targeted by the U.S. government. Mm. And finally, before we move on from this, uh, so Kim Jong-un mentioned this uh, Mount Kungangsan mm -hmm. project and the Kaesong Industrial Complex, but who was this uh, 
message aimed at? Was it aimed at the South Koreans to help them uh, make this possible? Or was it aimed at the US saying we want uh, sanctions and some sort of uh, relief that, uh, to continue denuclearization talks? Well, the message is clearly aimed at South Korea. I mean, it's actually the current South Korean government who is very eager to reopen uh, the Kaesong industrial complex and restart the Mount Kangang tourism project. And then essentially the uh, Kim uh, signaled to South Korean government that uh, there, I mean, those will be risk, can be restarted uh, without any precondition on the part of North Korea. So actually the ball is actually in our court to whether we are going to restart the complex and, and the tourism project and thereby violate the sanctions. Hmm. I'm going to move on to a little new, another section of uh, Kim Jong-un's New Year's Day speech. During it, he mentioned yeah. North Korea needs to focus on producing electricity. Yeah. And he listed various means, such as hydro, yeah. tidal, uh, yeah. uh, wind and coal. But he also mentioned uh, atomic energy, yeah. atomic nuclear energy. And although he has mentioned nuclear power in the past yeah. in previous speeches, it's the first time he's really mentioned yeah. it since yeah. uh, he's basically yeah. pledged to denuclearize the regime. Yeah. Do you think that this was a deliberate mentioning of nuclear power? Because it certainly caught uh, many uh, analysts' eyes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they, they deliberately made a mention of uh, nuclear power because that was um, actually, uh, in order to develop nuclear power, you need uh, nuclear reactors. And a uh, nuclear reactor is essentially a controlled uh, nuclear reaction, unlike a nuclear bomb, which is an uncontrolled nuclear reaction. Uh, so in terms of uh, technology, I think uh, North Korea could pull that off on their own. But then it's a very complex and uh, expensive technology. And North Korea doesn't count with the financial resources to develop nuclear power on their own. Uh, so that's the reason why North Korea and the international community try to have, develop nuclear power as a part of a denuclearization package, uh, which was the result of the agreed framework uh, in the 90s. Mm. So the whole project was called the Korea Energy Development Organization. And South Korea, Japan, the United States, and other countries spent uh, more than almost actually $3 billion to develop the nuclear, reacts, re nuclear reactors for civilian use uh, in uh, North Korea. It's actually, it was actually the North Koreans who canceled the project when they carried out the first nuclear test in 2006. So what uh, Kim Jong-un is saying is essentially it's, uh, making a very reference to uh, the Kido uh, experience in the, in the 2000s and thereby he's actually essentially signaling to the international community that uh, nuclear power could be a potential uh, offer from the international community which could be reciprocated by North Korea's denuclearization steps. What do you think the international community's reaction will be to this uh, possible suggestion? <laughs> well, the international community will remember what happened to Kido in 2000 and uh, they'll probably react uh, that, that they don't want to go buy the same horse twice. Mm. So, uh, I mean, without a significant uh, pre-steps uh, by North Korea to denuclearize its nuclear capability, uh, a significant investment like uh, um, setting up nuclear directors for North Korea will be off the table. Well, we'll have to see whether this does become involved mm. in the denuclearization mm. talks going forward in the months ahead. Before we go as well, uh, one more thing I want to talk to you about. So while all these uh, mm. developments have been happening, there's a bit another spanner in the works almost mm. because a, it's been reported that a North Korean diplomat mm. in uh, Italy has gone missing. Mm -hmm. The uh, charge d'affair of the North's embassy in Rome, Cho Song Gil, there are some reports that say he's seeking asylum mm -hmm. uh, by the Italian government. But then an Italian government has now, uh, official has now come out and said that um, that's not the case yet. That he hasn't really applied for asylum. I mean, what do we know of the situation so far? Uh, what would it mean if it does turn out to be true? Well, we, we know that uh, this uh, child affairs, uh, Mr. Cho, is under the Italian government's protection. So if the Italian government explained that he hasn't really applied for asylum yet, that probably means that he's undecided where to uh, apply for asylum. Maybe it's going to be a Western country, such as a European country, or could be Italy itself, or could be the United States, or could be South Korea as well. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, he's still in limbo, or maybe Italian government is facing a lot of, I mean, maybe Mr. Cho is uh, facing a lot of pressure from the North Korean government itself. So we don't know clearly what's really going on, but then it's probably true that uh, the charged affairs in uh, North Korean charged affairs in Rome try to defect. So what does it mean? I mean, uh, we have seen this before several times, North Korean diplomats trying to defect to the West. So some people might say this is an indication that the North Korean regime is becoming unstable, but actually I will probably disagree with that kind of statement because uh, oftentimes, uh, I mean, first of all, we have seen many uh, defections like this in the past and then the 
clearly the North Korean regime still stands, so that's one reason. Uh, another reason is because much or many of these defections are actually uh, outcome of uh, uh, the North Korean who have a fine opportunity to defect. And uh, obviously, the North Korean diplomats who are posted abroad have the most opportunity to defect to, to the West. Mm -hmm. So this is a niche of opportunity as well. So uh, I would say that uh, this does, it's actually a significant, uh, 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 I mean, uh, in the sense that uh, a high-level North Korean diplomat is defected in the West, especially if uh, he has access to high-level information, uh, confidential information about the regime. But in terms of a, as an indication about regime stability, I wouldn't say it is a, it's a valid indicator. Mm, interesting. Anyway, thank you for coming in today, and it's always great to get you insights. My pleasure. And that's all for today's programme. I'll be back next week with more analysis of the day's top stories. In the meantime, stay tuned to our later newscasts for the latest updates and hope you have a great weekend. Goodbye. Join us on this week's edition of Foreign Correspondents.